active in some workshops. Uh, our next speaker uh, is the founder of Dogma Debates, uh, first an online forum, but now a thriving, to say the least, podcast. Uh, our next speaker has been a very close friend of mine, met him just about a year ago, and uh, it's been great ever since. Our next speaker, David Smalley. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you everybody for being here. And uh, of course, to everybody who put this amazing event on. This has been an incredible conference, right? I mean, seriously, round of applause for people who put this together. <laughs> I've had an absolute blast being here. Um, before I get started, I want to talk a little bit about being here and how we got here and what this movement's doing. Um, as you know, um, Evolvefish is one of the sponsors for Dog Debate, and I was talking to Gary, the owner of Evolvefish, um, when he was in the Denver airport on his way to come out here. And you know, a lot of conferences request for these guys to come out and sell the merchandise and things. And he told me um, that the main reason he said, David, the main reason I am sitting in this airport right now is because I was listening to your show, and I heard Kevin from the SSA say, you know your conference has made it when a fault fish is there. <laughs> and, he said, and he said, I want to help him make this conference. And that's why I'm coming. The grassroots of this movement is amazing. And uh, you know, we, we all come here and we have a blast doing this. But at the end of the day, when we leave this conference, the reality is we have to go live and function and operate in a Christian society, in a, in a Christian dominated society. So that's why I want to talk about approaching theists today. Um, there are several different approaches um, that we can take. Now, as we found out today when uh, talking or uh, listening to uh, Jerry, who was an, an awesome presentation, by the way. Um, Different things work for different people, right? And, and that's, that's, that's my thing, too. I, I want you to be comfortable, but more importantly, do what fits your style. I think his comment was, if you're an ass, share your gift with people. And that's <laughs> awesome. That's exactly what we're talking about. Do what's comfortable for you. Um, and satire, of course, as if you saw the show last night, we absolutely love satire, and I think that is very valid. But there are different situations and different times and, and different things where different things work, right? In a show setting, I don't necessarily want to take this approach. I want to take the, uh, the satire approach. I want people to, to laugh and have fun. But I'll also laugh at atheists. I will also make fun of everyone across the board to say that we, we, we can recognize our own faults and, and we can be OK with that. So apply the approach that best fits your personality. But when you're having a conversation with someone, that family member, that, that uh, mother, father, cousin, someone that you have to interact with on a regular basis. Satire may not always work. In fact, it may be harmful. It can be. Um, so it's important to, and, and again, shocker, some atheists may disagree with this presentation, right? Um, and that's OK. That's perfectly fine. Because, uh, like I said, different things work for different people. But if you're interested in the diplomatic approach, if you're interested in an approach to dealing with the theist that's on a more of a personal level, this is one I'm proposing. This is a, a method that seems to work for me in dealing with my family, which certainly isn't perfect if, if you've read the book. Um, so in a diplomatic approach, it's important to find common ground, uh, admitting your own faults and imperfections. Uh, help them to discover their own doubts. And more importantly, show them that atheism can be a safe landing place. It was Aristotle that said, it is a mark of an educated mind to entertain a thought without accepting it even if the thought is ridiculous to us, because a lot of the times it is. You don't have to accept their idea as truth in order to entertain it and understand that it means something to them. Because it's okay to be angry. We have a lot to be pissed off about. And if you haven't already, I strongly encourage you to pick up Greta Christina's book, Why Are You Atheists So Angry? Because she literally lists 99 things that piss off the godless. And if you weren't pissed when you start reading it, you'll be pissed by the time you're done. <laughs> we have so many things to be pissed off about, and it's OK to have that anger. And, and, and a lot of times, that anger can be productive. A lot of times, when, when I talk about a diplomatic approach or being nice, 
in your approach to, to theists, specifically Christians. People seem to think that I, I mean let go of your anger. No, that anger, use that anger as motivation. But your behavior needs to be a little different from anger if you want to have this diplomatic approach. Because directing that anger toward the believer can often create a lot more problems. You cannot undo a lifetime of indoctrination in a single conversation. You just can't. Especially if you're screaming at them, making them feel like crap inside. We want them to come back. We want them to research. This is probably the most important thing in the presentation. I want to read it to you right now. While religion as a whole may deserve ridicule, and you are very well within your rights to be angry at the atrocities caused by belief, directing that anger toward the believer can often be counterproductive and drive them back into their religion for safety. We don't want to do that. So in order to talk to them, we have to understand the believer. How did they get here? What do we mean when we talk about group psychology? This is my take on it. Many believers are basically victims of lifelong indoctrination, mental and verbal abuse, who have developed this form of Stockholm Syndrome for their captors. They are victims themselves, but they don't know, any, they don't know anything else. Now, don't get me wrong. Every adult is responsible for their own behavior. When these people are going to the voting booths and voting to take away rights from gays, take away rights from women, they're responsible for those votes, and we have a right to be pissed off about that. But why are they making those decisions? Is it possible that they are victims themselves? They've developed a safety net in the belief. They've attached that social structure, and they understand what they're giving up if they talk out against that belief. And when that belief is shaken, they become terrified and angry. Think about it like this. Suppose you have a friend that's been in a severely abusive relationship. Let's say she's in love with this man, and he continues to hit her, hurt her, uh, lessen her self-confidence, make her feel horrible inside. And then she comes to you with black eyes and a broken nose, and you have one moment to speak to her. You have that 30-second window to change her life. Is, is staying in that relationship stupid? Yes. Is she now contributing to her own uh, self-deprecation and, and pain? Yes. By staying, is she causing that? Yes. But if you've got a small window to talk to her, what are you going to say? You're stupid. Get out of that damn relationship, you delusional idiot. You're going to do the same thing he's been doing to her? You're going to drive her back to her safety net. Just think about that. If you have a small window of approach, and you use that approach to attack, you very well could be doing more harm. On the topic of group psychology, Dr. David Elder wrote a book, Atheism Advanced, 2007. It's very, very influential in my life. Uh, and I quote it a lot in my book, Baptized Atheist, because it was so influential. And actually, I had the honor of having Dr. Elder write a foreword for my book, which I was blown away when he agreed to do that. He writes, Within groups, negative attitudes toward other members are minimized and denied. So people in their own church, they get a lot of free passes to screw up, resulting in narcissism toward the group and hostility toward outsiders. Such groups overlook the failings of their own. This is why when their preacher doesn't have all the answers, they say, well, he's just a man and we have faith. But when you don't have all the answers, it's because you don't have Jesus. Because they think you're not in their group. In 1921, Freud noted that in order for a group to strengthen, the people must replace a piece of themselves with a piece of the group, meaning their ego or their confidence. We can see this in real time just about any college football game when it's 12 degrees outside and there are six guys with no shirts on with eagles painted across their chest. E, e A, G, right? You. He wouldn't be doing that in his driveway. You know, by himself, it, it's the group. His ego is gone. I mean, his, his pride is out the window. He has now sacrificed that for the group. He has replaced a piece of himself with that group. So when a member of a religion is that deeply entrenched, a panic arises if a group like that becomes disintegrated. So when we're actually talking to believers about leaving their religion, or about even thinking about questioning their religion, what are we asking them to do? We're asking them to remove a piece of themselves. We're literally asking them to give something up that is a part of them. And that's 
huge. So we want to validate. We want to validate their concerns. Now, that doesn't mean that you're validating their accuracy or that their religion is important or true. You're simply validating their feelings and the power their religion holds in their lives. There's nothing wrong with that. You're saying, I understand how important your religion is to you. I was there once. I understand. Finding that common ground and validating that is not saying, I can accept Jesus. It's not the same thing. Don't think that. So before we begin poking holes in their religion, which, which many need to hear, find common ground. Admit your own faults. Show them that human side of atheism. Be humble in learning rather than arrogant in teaching. Tell the believer things like you understand why they feel so attached. You understand the emotional connection. You can relate to the social aspects of religion, and often we, we crave that too. You understand the fear of being ostracized. In fact, many of us have been at one point or another. You've read the religious doctrines. You don't have all the answers either. But here's the difference. Here's the split. And it's okay to tell them this. You're not okay with assuming that a God will fill in the gaps. We've got a lot of common ground, a lot more common ground with believers than they may realize. And they'll realize that you are a member of their group. You're a member of the group that cares about truth, reality, and humanity. Because many, many Christians really do. They're misguided but they really have good intentions. The next phase, I, I think, is to help them understand believers. We didn't make a decision to become atheists. Belief isn't a choice. You analyze the data, it's either going to make sense to you or it doesn't. They, they think that it's a, it, it's a conscious decision to say, I choose against God. And we can do that any more than they can choose against leprechauns. We know that, but we need to explain to them it's not a choice. While many atheists do want to see religion eventually go away, it doesn't mean we all want it to happen by force. Can you tell I read, read this book recently? <laughs> we want to see it happen by persuasion, as she points out. And I think that's a shocker for a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians think we all want religion to completely disappear immediately by force, by law. They don't understand that we actually support their constitutional right to be theologically wrong. It's a, what we understand. But we also support our own rights of being productive without it, and more importantly, children's rights to not be harmed by its practices. And as you're talking to believers about why you care, remember these things. And the 99 credit lists. And all the others that you can think of. All the reasons that you were pissed off and all the harm that religion causes, and explain to them that we are not fighting against religion because we have so much hate. We are fighting against religion because we have that much love. It's truly from compassion. And even though your religion makes you feel good, we can't deny that the core, that the core of these atrocities lies in the basis of that same belief. You can say, well, I, you know, I just want to love my neighbor. Okay, do we need to stone homosexuals to death for you to love your neighbor? Do we have to kill infants in 1 Samuel 15, 3 for you to love your neighbor? These things aren't necessary. We've researched your religion. We've analyzed its historical inaccuracies because we do care, not because we are angry or because we hate it. It's because we care about the truth. And I tweeted this recently, and I want you to use it. We're not against all the wonderful things you think the Bible stands for. We're against what you don't know it says. This has actually worked for me several times. Because you know what the believer thinks. They think that because you are an atheist, you are anti-Christian, you are anti-religion. Okay, many of those things may be true to, to some degree for, for all of us. But to them, what that means is you're against all of the goodness in the Bible. You're against loving your neighbor. You're against helping the poor. You're against these things. They don't understand that we love those things. They just happen to be in the Bible too. But we're okay with that. What we hate most about religion, most believers don't even realize is a part of it. So pointing that out to them, I think, really helps. And it's important to ask them questions. Because I've got to tell you, and I've done this a lot on my show, when I have preachers and pastors in the studio, it's much more rewarding. Rather than telling a believer they are wrong about something, 
than to ask them enough questions and then watch their face as they discover it. When they realize that it doesn't make sense. I had a Christian police officer on my show one time. And I asked him a series of questions, uh, going all the way back to Numbers 22, 28, which is the Bible verse I, I picked out last night on the show, uh, where Balaam has a full conversation with a donkey. The donkey says three sentences to Balaam, and I'm, I'm talking to this Christian police officer about this. And um, I asked him if he believed it, literally. He said, of course, it's the Word of God. And I said to him, I, I don't mean to offend you, but I, I have to tell you, it makes me nervous that you believe in a talking donkey and you carry a gun for a living. <laughs> and he said, well, when you put it that way, I sound ridiculous. <laughs> okay, so put it your own way, you know? They don't want, it, it makes them very uncomfortable to hear the same thing uh, back to them that they've just said to us without the assumption of faith. But when asking these types of questions, keep in mind... Uh, their group psychology. Try to avoid, avoid the sarcasm of the Because a strong negative opposition strengthens the group mindset. And this is one that's it's really strange, but very, very true. In essence, they want to feel persecuted. They want to feel victimized by you. But why? Because that's what they've been told to expect. In church, you're either with us or against us. I believe it's Mark 9. Mark somewhere, right? If, if they, and it's, it's all over the Bible, too. It, it's they, they want to feel victimized because they've been told, you're going to be victimized when you go out there because they're trying to take away your Christianity. Secular America is trying to take away Christianity. So when they mention it and you bark back at them, do you really know what you're doing? This is what you're doing. You're falling into exactly what their preacher has been screaming and confirming their religious leader's truthfulness. Hey, that's exactly what Pastor John told me was going to happen. Which leads uh, them to believe even more crap that he's going to say. So be very careful about what you're actually accomplishing. Ask their opinion. Again, more asking questions. Ask their opinion of Bible verses. These, some fun ones. And it's not always important what I've found, even on, on the show. It's not always important to argue with their answer. Sometimes, and I get, atheists are, are so mean to me sometimes, I get emails, uh, why didn't you call him on that? Why did you let him get away with that? Why? Because it's not always uh, about being right at that moment. Because I may ask about Matthew 10, 34, and they'll say, oh, well, that's just hyperbole. He didn't really mean. He came to divide everybody. Oh, okay. How do you feel about 1 Samuel 15, 3, where God orders infants to be slaughtered? Is that, is that okay with you? Well, no, but that was back then, and I'm, I'm sure he had a good reason. Really? You think there's a good reason? Well, yeah, maybe. Oh, then what about Isaiah 45, 7, God crazy? And it's not really one question that's doing the damage. It's this repetitive list of questions to make them start thinking, this is crazy. And you can see the look on their face as they start to have to make excuses. And sometimes my last question is, do you think maybe... It's strange that you have to make so many excuses for such an omnipotent, amazing creature. <laughs> they may have an answer for you first, but if you ask them right, and you maintain that diplomatic approach, it's very likely that they will go back and do some research. And that's what we want. Ask questions like this, let me get a little more complicated. If heaven has free will, but no evil, well, then that means evil isn't necessary on earth in order to have free will. So why do you think that God would create all of this? It doesn't matter what their answer is. It's making them think about it that's important. What bothers you about Islam? And then show them the exact same thing in the Bible. Because it's probably there. This is a fun one. <laughs> if I told you today that my friend died and came back to life, would you believe me? Every time. No. Oh, but if I wrote it down 2,000 years ago in a language you don't understand, that makes it more believable? <laughs> I'm not ridiculing, I'm stating the fact. But we can't just bitch about their religion. We can't just complain and tell them that they're wrong and make them discover that they're wrong. It's also important to offer solutions and resources to help them continue their journey to atheism because that's ultimately the goal. Remind them that these questions are so confusing because God is in the equation. 
It only begs more questions. Why? How? What? This doesn't make any sense. Why would something allow something like that? But once we remove God from the equation, the answers start to make sense. Atheism can be a safe landing place. And like Jerry was talking about this morning, living your life and being happy as an atheist is, as an atheist is probably the single most bothersome thing you can do to Christians. Because they think you have to be miserable without God. And the fact that you're happy and smiling, I, I all the time, I, my truck is the one out there with the atheist license plate in Texas. And I park, and my, my garage is completely cleared out, but sometimes I just want to display it. And I park in the driveway, and my neighbors uh, will come up and I, hi, how you guys doing? And I wave at them. I want them to know there's a smiling face next door. If you need anything, let me know. The uh, lady across the street from me, very, 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 very super Christian lady, um, I go over there. Uh, to change the uh, batteries in her smoke detectors. And I was doing this and helping her with lawn work and things before she ever found out that I was an atheist. And when she found out, she, uh, she was shocked. And we had a very brief conversation. And all she told me was, um, you've changed a little bit of what I thought about atheists, but I certainly disagree with you. That's fine. To me, I, I think I've done something for her, even if it's just a little bit. Here's the key. Engage everyone. Come out and be proud of it. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Again, as Greta says, if you can safely come out. We understand a lot of times you can't. But if you can, come out. <laughs> this, is, this doesn't say reply to all those emails. It says reply all to those emails. And you know what emails I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The entire family is blasted. I'll tell you this really quick before my time's up. My aunt, super conservative, um, sends an email blast to everyone stating that we should uh, make a law stating that you can only sing our national anthem in English. And that should be a law. That literally, if you are caught singing the national anthem in any language other than English, you should be arrested. And my entire Christian family is, is copied on this email. And of course at the bottom it says, and if you disagree with this, you can just delete it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's not the way I work. <laughs> and you know what, I'm not going to reply with it because that's flying exactly in the face of what I'm going to talk about today. But here's what I did say. I replied all and I said, you know, Jesus spoke Aramaic. Aha. <laughs> Would you be okay with him singing our national anthem in his language? She replies all, since when did you become an expert on Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> so I replied all, since I became an atheist. <laughs> How many people here were at uh, the Texas Free Thought Convention in Austin? Did you guys see uh, the one crazy preacher that has a giant sign? He was screaming. He appeared to be insane. I was leaving with uh, Daniel Moran and uh, Jessica Alquist. We were walk walking out together. We walked right by him. And I was like, guys, hold on a second. I walked over. I shook his hand. And I said, I want you to know. Because I, as we were walking in, he said something about um, atheists being idiots. I remember that that phrase coming out of his mouth. So I walked over to him and I shook his hand and I said, uh, I want you to know I support your constitutional right to be here doing what you're doing. But we're not atheists. Uh, I said, but we're not idiots. We just really do care. And in a completely different voice than I'd heard all day, he shook my hand and said, I support your right to be here too. I appreciate what you guys are doing. <laughs> it's like he's playing a character, right? It's, it's crazy. There is that human element there. Join local groups like the SSA. You, you clap for the SSA. <laughs> Thank you for my breaks, Kevin. I, I, I left my, uh, my other one at my mom's house. She swears I did it on purpose. <laughs> it's like, I'm, like you're accidentally going to put it on, mom. <laughs> Become a voting block. Very, very important. We do have a voice. And finally, 
And most importantly, never pass up a chance to be heard because the next mind you change could change thousands. Thank you. So, real quick, uh, in the last slide, I, I'd like to uh, ask your opinion on uh, that there, I, I believe there, it's, there are times when it's appropriate and inappropriate to respond or to say something. Or say, um, uh, one of our members, uh, and I mentioned this in, in my talk recently, the, the member had a niece that, was, that had cancer. And uh, that was the inappropriate time for her to have the conversation on, on this and that. So, uh, or two weeks ago, my parents were very religious, were celebrating their 50th anniversary. There was a band preacher, uh, re you know, renewing their vows and things like that. And uh, I knew that that was the wrong time to engage the preacher as much as I wanted to uh, and, and do that. So I think uh, that we have to be conscious uh, of, of that. It worked you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Thank you. It's a great question. Uh, in fact, sometimes, and I know this is going to sound strange at first, sometimes understanding that and not saying anything, especially when people in the room do know you're, you're, that they, you're an atheist, is in itself setting that good example of diplomacy. What I mean by that is um, I have a half-sister, and her father recently died, and the, the funeral was in the church. And I didn't even think twice about it. I'm going, right? And I went. And I sat there, and of course I didn't say a thing. I'm not going to get up and go, bullshit, you know? Like, oh, Why do that? Well, I know a couple, but. <laughs> and so, um, and, and of course, they, they did that thing, even at the, the, the those funerals where they say, and if you ever want to see him again, you will accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And they really lay it on thick. And I'll tell you, that pisses Christians off, big time. The, the people that are there that want to celebrate that person's life, they get very frustrated when the preacher starts to that, that they're smart enough to know he's using that that death to manipulate these people. They know, they know. Um, but I'll tell you, after everything was over, my sister, who's a Christian, didn't tell me this. She told my mother, who's also a Christian and swears I'm going to be a preacher someday. <laughs> um, she said, even though I was up there and I was, at, and I was at my father's funeral, all I was thinking about is how much respect I have for my atheist brother. It was back there in the church and not saying anything. That can be a form of activism. Um, when you're um, discussing religion or whatnot with um, a theist and they counter with just having faith, what do you feel is the best response to that? Because I usually just call it quits then because they're acknowledging that they're going to continue to believe despite the fact that there's any evidence whatsoever. Well, typically what I'll do is ask them questions about why they have the faith, and ask them things like, uh, don't you feel like that you should have a basis for your faith, right? And also, there's a section in my book called, that I call the Faithometer Theory. Things that, uh, faith could be on like a sliding scale, right? Do we have faith that the sun is coming up tomorrow? Well, I'm pretty, you know, that we're going to see the sun tomorrow, let me put it that way. Huh? Physicists in here are going, ah, it doesn't come up! <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean. So, um, I talk about the difference in understanding something based on uh, practical uh, results, but I, I, I never advise to just give up. Absolutely not, because um, you, you can say, well, that's the difference for us. Maybe put it to the side and move to something else. Why do you have faith? Why do you believe it? Do you think it's because your parents taught it to you? Or is it because you came to that reason on your own? And at least make them question why that faith is there. But and it, even if you have to move it over and talk about other things, you can always come back to it once they have other doubts, other parts of the book. Where's the mic? There it is. Um, so, like, that question, uh, one thing I always hear when I talk to students is, at the very end of the conversation, you know, was, oh, I'll just pray for you. It'll be, it'll be okay. So, you know what I say to that? I know how much that means to you. Thank you. You may disagree with it. You may be completely irritated by it, it may piss you off, and it makes a lot of atheists angry and, and insulted. But you know what? I know what they're doing. They're going to talk to themselves. They're going to think about me. And if they're thinking about me, they're thinking about atheism. Oh. Oh. Say, say that again. Say what you said. I have 
no idea what you're talking about. I, 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 I'll be praying for you. Oh, thank you. I, I tell them thank you because I, I, I say that um, I, I know how much that means to you I, yeah, that's to be I'm thinking saying. about me, so I appreciate it. Yeah. I don't take offense to it. I, I had a debate at a Church of Christ uh, church, um, and uh, at the end of it, both the preacher and I stepped down and were meeting people, and I think one person went over to him, and I had a line wrapped around, and I think there were probably 15 people, and almost every one of them shook my hand and said, thank you so much for being here, thank you so much. And every now and then they would say, uh, I'm going to be praying for you, and I would say thank you. I, I understand what that means to you, and I certainly appreciate it. And I, and I move on. One man, had to be in his 80s, shook my hand and said, son, you've given me a whole hell of a lot to think about. I got chills when he said that. Oh, this man has been in that church for 30-something years. I, I was blown away by that. You know what? But if I'd have been rude, if I'd been like, don't you pray for me, and I, he, I don't think he would have even approached me to say that. And I would have never known that I made a difference in that. Are we on time? Are we good? Yeah, sure. Quick questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Is your slide presentation available online? Um, can you access the Dropbox? No, not yet. Um, I, I, I can make it available online. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. So what do you say to people who dismiss parts of the Bible and say, well, I don't believe that, but I believe, you know, I believe a different way or something. You know what I mean? When they completely reject a, a certain part yeah. of the Bible? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would ask things like, do you believe that the Bible is God's word? Again, I go back to my questions I was talking about. There's, there's typically whatever you want to, instead of saying what you want to say to them, think about three questions you could ask in order to make them say it to themselves. Do you believe the Bible is the word of God? Do you believe that when it says Jesus came back from the dead, that that's God's word and that's true? Yes, then why isn't this God's word? And then they say things like, well, uh, that, you know, man screwed that up. There are a lot of fallible men that screwed up the Bible. Okay, how do we know which parts they got right? Is it just the parts that make you feel good? And even just saying that, even if they go, no, 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 blah, vomit. <laughs> They're thinking about it. They are thinking about it. Uh, one thing I haven't heard you talk about is how you handle, like, you know, the health threats and the death threats. And, I mean, I've even had some people, like, vandalize my car. Like, you know, I don't know what I want to. But I haven't heard you, like, discuss that. Like, how do you handle, like, the threats of, like, oh, we're going to go to hell. And, you know, they're really brave. I mean, I don't think that's really even a discussion. They're just telling you you're going to go to hell. I mean, I, I was walking into on the border one day with my daughter, Talissa, who's eight years old. We were holding hands and walking across the parking lot. My license plate, my park, and my license plate, of course, is facing the street. And the lady takes the time to roll down her window as we're walking in, and she screams, You're going to hell! With my daughter. And I look down at her thinking, Oh, God, she's going to freak out. She goes, Christians. <laughs> say things like, you know, you think Jesus would have told me that? You know, a lot of times you have to speak Christian, even though David Elder in his book, Atheism Advanced, specifically says, don't speak Christian. Don't get in, don't speak in their terms of, of angels, and don't say God. Say the Christian God, or Yahweh, or a God. Because you can't drag, if they drag you kicking and screaming into their vocabulary, you're ultimately already losing the argument. But sometimes I've found that I break his rule, and I do that on purpose to be able to reason with so, I mean, that, I mean that, that, that's a tough one, but uh, if it's just a blatant threat, you're going to hell, okay, whatever. I mean, I, I wouldn't really necessarily have a need to respond to that. But if it's a part of an overall discussion, you can reply to them by saying, I don't fear hell, and if you can ever let go of the fear of hell, you can be as happy as I am. <laughs> you write that down, email that to me, because that's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's kind of like a situation you might get your opinion on. But last, I can't remember what it was, like before Christmas, uh, my boyfriend's dad was in the hospital for various reasons. They didn't know if he'd make it. He, he did. He's okay now. Um, and his whole family is very religious. And every other post on their wall that week on Facebook was, we're praying and thanks to God that he survived and all this stuff. 
and Toby was like, it really upset him. And but he, rather than say something on their Facebook, you know, because that's his comment about when it's appropriate, you know, that's his dad too, and he has a right to deal with it the way he wants to. So he made a post saying, you know, I want to thank the doctors and nurses at such and such hospital for helping him out. That's beautiful. It was, and he got a lot of support from his friends, and then one of his cousins came on and just immediately said, that's nice, but you should pray to God, and went on this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And See, and, I, and I'm telling you, I think, again, that's one of those things like the you're going to hell thing that she was talking about, that it does more harm for their cause than good. Because what he did was, he offered support for what was going on without the religious undertones, right? And was perfectly fine with it. It was supportive, it was honest, it was beautiful. But this guy coming on going, no, you have to grieve and worry the way I worry. That's ridiculous. And he's making himself look like an ass. So I absolutely love the post that, that your boy made. That's great. Yeah, it, like I said, like his friends were all supportive. And then as soon as his cousin came on and said that, his family came on, especially like his sister, and immediately started saying, I don't understand why you're mad at your cousin now. Why do you have to make this post? And saying, yeah. you know what I mean? It's yeah. like if he had gone on to theirs and said something, they would have known exactly how he felt about it. Yeah, exactly. But, and you know what? I, I never think that dealing with a, a major illness or the loss of a family member or death in any way is the time to approach believers and argue them out of their religion. I don't. I think it's completely ineffective. I think it's rude, and I think it's just as rude as preachers trying to grab people into Christianity in the face of death as well at those funerals. So I personally stay away from that. I will stay quiet as other people are praying. I don't start singing Mary Had a Little Lamb or anything. I don't, I don't, I'm not rude about it. But I do offer things like, uh, you know, I'll say things like at a funeral, uh, I'll certainly be thinking about you. If there's anything you need, let me know. Um, I, a, a family member recently died, and I... Um, I called the, the closest living family member and I said, I would like to do something for you. Would you? I, I was thinking about sending flowers. Would you rather me make a donation? I want to help. Because people will spend $240 on these beautiful flyers and they're like, thanks, but we have bills and medical costs and funeral costs and we need to raise money. So doing something that actually helps without insulting the religion is often the best thing we can do in something uh, so tragic as a death or Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think my question was, I was going to say, well, first of all, I was going to say, I think this is a great session you're having. And Thank you. I, I love debating with Christians all the time, so I can't really relate to what you're saying. My question, though, is a little different than most people, because I'm, I'm like a second generation atheist. So a lot of times, um, I don't get, like, I don't come from religion to atheism. I'm born in it, <laughs> right. so to speak, born into it, to speak. And a lot of times I'm talking to the Christians and they use Christian means as has been used or they're like, I don't feel like I can relate to them very well because they're like, what the hell are they talking about? You know, at least myself, you know what I'm saying? Like, what? You know, and I mean, I can understand with them and I always have to understand, but I never, I never make that connection within that common ground that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. And I was just asking if you had any suggestions for maybe people. I, I know we're not very many of them, not very many of us second generation atheists, but is there anything? Do you suggest? Or am I just not You're screwed. <laughs> no, I mean, I know it's, it's certainly got to be more difficult for you to understand the belief perspective. I think most of us that were, were in religion at one point and then became an atheist, it's easier for us to understand the compassion. When you're a second generation atheist, you're like, why are these people delusional and proud of it? This doesn't make any exactly. sense to me. Yeah. But <laughs> those, of us that have had that, yeah, those of us that have had that pride and that delusion, we understand. So all I can ask you to do is just try your best to understand what that can possibly be like. And like I was talking about, it doesn't have to even be based on religion. Like I was talking about with a friend who's in an abusive relationship. Try to draw uh, a parallel there and understand that these, a lot of these people, although they are becoming bullies themselves, are in fact victims. Because you know what? It's a hell of a lot easier to turn into a bully than it is to stand up to one. And that's what they're doing. They're turning into another bully because it's easier to bully other people than it is to look back at your bully and say, shut the hell up. And understanding that can, can really help you find that common ground with Christians and understand that a lot of what they're saying is out of their own fear of, of being wrong. 
Any more questions? Last question. Hey, so, uh, Fourth listener. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> so uh, you uh, you mentioned that list of uh, Bible verses to bring up like, when you're debating people. So you're like, what's your opinion on this and this? this? So I just wanted to mention for anybody who might not know about it, there's a website called the Skeptics Annotated Bible. Yes. And it has um, just a huge list of like all these really crazy Bible verses, and you can just uh, it has them categorized, and so you can click on like murder, rape, genocide, whatever. And yep. Also, um, evil evil Bible is it dot com or dot org? Dot com. EvilBible.com is great. I get a lot of stuff there from the show. Also, what has a lot of Bible verses in it is the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> you may want to check that thing out and read it because uh, pulling up the verse, great idea, but actually look at it in the Bible that you have. I know you have them. Yes, I know you got them. Actually look at it and read maybe the whole chapter. Read a few verses before and a few verses after so that when they say you're taking that out of context, say, actually, no, I'm not. Here's what it says before and here's what it says after it. Know your arguments. Just like this t-shirt that I'm wearing, and like the one I wore yesterday, they have Bible verses on the back of them. Sometimes we paraphrase. But the point is that a lot of times when people hear the word atheist, they think, oh, you just don't know about the good news. Let me tell you. <laughs> Hold on. This is your stop sign. <laughs> I have read it. And be prepared to defend the verses that you're going to bring up. So do the research. Pull those up. What he said is a great, great uh, tip. But also, absolutely be able to back up your arguments. All right, get it small, everyone. Thank you.